<laughs> Here's the thing. Today we're in San Dimas, California, and I snuck into Immortal Masks. One of the coolest mask makers you guys will ever, you're ever gonna find. Today's Grim Adventure is all about the making of some of the scariest, coolest, realistic masks in the industry. I think they're on to me. <laughs> Maniacal laugh time. Michael! Oh man, oh man. Where is this guy? <laughs> all right, I think I'm good. <laughs> I found you. Uh, all right, all right, fair enough. <laughs> I'm excited about this. Get in here. The adventure begins now. All right, Your nightmare go. begins now. See, I'm full of bad <laughs> puns. <laughs> you are horrible. Hey everybody, how you doing? My name is George Frangidakis. I am the co-owner of Immortal Masks in San Dimas, California, and we are the world's largest silicone mask company. Uh, and today, I'm gonna give you like a little tour and kind of take a spooky Mr. Rogers approach on how these things are made. Um, this is our conference room, welcome, and uh, let's take a look at a couple of things here. This is something fun we did for um, Universal Hollywood's Horror Nights, and this was many years ago, and he is Chop Top from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Now, this is a paint prototype. It's probably not what the last one looked like, the, uh, the final design looked like. We were trying things with the birthmark and then uh, laying in different shades of like five o'clock shadow, so you see a couple different shades in here to, where we landed on the, the right one and uh, what the metal might look like too, and eventually we had hair punching in it too, but. Um, since this was a tester, he's kind of our archive and he ended up in this room, so it's something we have to look at and go, remember when? And then we have pieces like this. Um, this was made by a friend of mine, um, a fabulous artist that first came out of England and now he lives actually in Alabama. His name is Lee Hurley of Hurley FX. Um, and he made this absolutely amazing full-size wearable Groot suit, like unbelievable. Um, and we're friends and um, we've kind of helped each other over the years with just ideas and um, I'm lucky enough to, uh, to get a casting from the original mold and he sent it out to us and it's like a prize piece um, in, in our collection here because um, we're big nerds just like, you know. <laughs> I mean, love that it's bigger than you. Yeah. <laughs> so it's more fun sometimes to have like other people's stuff in our shop, you know, because we see our masks every day. So it's like cool to have like other things. And this room definitely is one of the rooms where uh, you'll see um, artwork from a lot of different artists. Uh, and then we got things like this, which is, for, this is like a grail piece for me. This is a, I, I'm a huge fan of Donnie Darko. I'm, I'm sure, you know, other people out there in, uh, in Grim Life Land are too. Um, and this is actually a casting from the, the original mold. Um, and I was lucky enough to get one and it uh, got to my friend, Jimmy Duvall, who played Frank the Bunny in Donnie Darko, James and I worked on a movie called Sushi Girl years ago and we've been friends since. And he kind of, uh, he, he facilitated, there was like a limited edition of a couple of these went out and he, he signed it and Rob Berman, the original sculptor of the mask signed it too. And yeah, it's kind of a fun thing to have in our collection here at Immortal Masks. Well, we could spend all day here, trust me. But what you guys really want to see is the stuff that we make. Let's go take a trip into the shop. All right, this is where the actual magic starts. This is the sculpting room. This is where all of our ideas uh, get translated to the clay. And this right here is my partner, Andrew Freeman. This Hello, is the Andrew. guy that started in Mortal Masks. Hey, everybody. And uh, he's also the, you know, the head of the art department, and he is our principal sculptor. And he is working on a new mask that's actually part of a trio of, um, of scary luchadors. And uh, tell us about this guy. Yeah, well, he's basically just that. He's a luchador creature. Uh, we, we, we came out with a character called uh, Lucha Gore um, last year, and he was Wait, really, Lucha Gore? Yeah, yeah. In fact, he's uh, we got a finished version of him right there. But uh, essentially, uh, we want to add you know to this family of, of wrestling monsters. So uh, this is going to be, uh, I think we're going to call him Kamazots, which is 
essentially like the Azto Aztec uh, name for the king of uh, bats. So we gave him like a, a kind of a vampire bat uh, aesthetic with ears and nose and big teeth. And uh, yeah, he's gonna be fun to to paint and, uh, and and see come to life. That's can we show the one that you were just pointing out? The sure, one that's over yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this is Luchagor. <laughs> this is the first one, and uh, and he was actually sculpted by the sculptor right behind us, um, Patrick Matthews. And uh, this was a really fun mask because it allowed us to not only play with um, what the monster was going to be, but how to capture that luchador mask look and, and paint and um, and get those, those cool like vinyl glitter looks and do it all in silicone paint. Very nice, very nice. Cool. Um, and then moving right along, um, well, the guy I was just talking about, this is Patrick Matthews. He was the one who sculpted the original Luchagor, and he's jumping on our, our zombie version of a Luchador mask. I'm gonna come right over your shoulder and look at this. Yeah, that's slick. Isn't that cool? And we're, we're running a couple different names on this one, right? We've, uh, we, we, we're not really sure where we're gonna land on yet, but we've, yeah, we think we have some ideas. It's a, kind of a fun way of translating certain uh, Spanish words uh, to see if it fits with this this guy. What did we land on so far with some of the new ones? Uh, I think uh, working one of the working names is La Decadencia. Or oh, that's right. El Decadencia. I'm sorry, my Spanish is <laughs> not, <laughs> not that correct. I'm going to butcher this one. Uh -huh. I think it should be El Larry Densa. Larry Densa. Oh, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So yeah, so this is a fun sculpture we're doing. The guys started this uh, Sunday. So um, oh wow, yeah, uh, they're 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 really fast <laughs> sculptors. So this is uh, moving along. We'll probably be done what within the week. Yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely. All right. um, we sculpt on an average of two to seven masks at a time, any given time. So right now we have these two being worked on. We have another mask out to a sculptor named Joey Orozco, who's sculpting another piece for us right now. Um, so that's three. That's a slow day in the sculpting room. Uh, we do have one over here we can show, the starting with, it's, a, it's our rabbit. Um, it's being sculpted by a friend of ours named Kodai. Um, and he comes in on the weekends and, and works on this, and it's getting close to being finished. You're gonna wanna see this, come okay. close. Um, so, so a lot of the ideas start here, Andrew, uh, is a voracious uh, illustrator. He likes to draw like uh, every day. Um, and so he fills these books with just ideas, um, sketches that are in his brain or things that him and I have talked about or you know, some of these have already even, even been done. Like they, some of these are actually already sculptures for, for our catalog. But um, it's just where he can get the ideas from his head out on the paper and then convey it to um, the us, the rest of the team, or even another sculptor that we've hired to, to take Andrew's il illustrations and bring him into the 3D realm. It's, it's good to have uh, just like this visual reference so that George and I can kind of come back to certain ideas and concepts and see if uh, things will work out. And yeah. A lot of these are designed with having a human kind of hidden within, so uh, they're all kind of designed to potentially be masks uh, with some trickery involved, but throughout the years, George and, George and I have gotten really good with like those little tricks. Well, it's fun because like e even like um, you know we hire outside sculptors, uh, friends of ours that, that work in the film industry. Uh, they'll come in and they'll they'll grab Andrew's books and then they'll flag like a bunch that like um, spoke to them. Like like you know, so we we want to find ideas that like also uh, that the sculptor is inspired by, and so like. Like re recently, like this one was sculpted by a friend of ours named Brian Wade, who's an amazing sculptor for the industry. And it really started with him thumbing through Andrew's books and putting a post-it note on a bunch of pages that, uh, that, that, that spoke to him. Well, it's an honor having Brian flesh this out because he's an amazing talent and he's been doing this for a long time. And uh, I've learned a lot from him throughout the years and uh, he did a really great job. So it's cool to see other people's interpretations of, of some of these characters as well. And uh, that's what makes the catalog so special. Yeah. So we're in the racks and uh, this is kind of our inventory area. This is where we keep uh, masks uh, that are gonna be going out, uh, things that are gonna be in our in-stock section, trade show stock. Um, but as we get into the shop, you might notice a couple things that I get blurred out. Now and again, we work on some high profile clients, pieces, film, music, um, celebrity disguise masks. 
um, specialized projects that uh, were either under non-disclosure or just part of the job as anonymity in itself. Uh, so please forgive the blurt if you see those things. It's just stuff that I, I can't show. I, I want to show you. <laughs> uh, I, I might even be able to show you, Michael, but I can't show all of you. Is this the video that you're telling me about? I got a cool video. Yeah, yeah, I got a pretty cool video. I know there's a bunch of them, but I got I got one that's like like the coolest of all videos. All right, so, cool. Yeah. Let's take a look at it. All right, I'll show you. Now I'm not gonna lie. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in high school, like doing something bad in the library, <laughs> like getting ready to smoke pot or something like got that. It. All right, so let's see this video. Okay. Um, I mean, like I said, it, it, he sent it to me. The client sent it to me. It, it was definitely so I could show some friends now and okay. again, but. Um, it is something kind of a fun project we got to do, and well, this is a reveal, so have, wait till you see the, who this is. Oh, shoot! <laughs> <laughs> now you were not kidding when you said you have some high-profile clients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one was um, that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that was a that was a yeah. That was like a one of those emails you get in the in the morning, and then you're like, wait, what? And then it progresses into a conversation you have with someone by midday, and by the end of the day, you're kind of like, am I really doing this? And then like a week later, it kind of all comes together, and you're like, wow, that was really cool. So we we and we get those now and again, and like, you know, we're we're used to doing a lot with the Hollywood music, and but now and again, there's still that one that kind of throws you. That was one of them. So I hate the fact that I can't show you. Guys I know, those. I know. I wish I could show you, but um, and yeah. I'm gonna say this: if you see it, so whenever people see us in, in person, and they're like, "Oh, so what was that?" People are gonna ask. You're gonna want to ask this, and trust me, you should ask. But I'm not gonna tell you who it was. Yeah. I'm not gonna tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's fun. <laughs> it's funny um, talking to you like you know, amongst our racks over here. It's like a, it's like we built a fort, right? Like I get to have these private conversations and show you like the weird intricacies of like of uh, of, of what made up our company and where we're at right now. And um, you went to film school, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Pittsburgh it's, filmmakers. Yeah. Same here. So like, and it's weird that like you know I do this now, and I came to LA to make movies, but now I make masks. And um, people always wonder, wonder, like, like I don't know, like, what did you, like, like, what did, what did film school prepare you for? You know, now that you're here, doing this stuff. Ooh, very good question. So honestly, I think film school really only taught me like the technical side of it. Like, I think up until that point, I didn't really know what the rule of thirds was, or right. lighting, or working with this camera or that. And I think that's about it. Yes. Yeah, Everything else, I feel, just kind of comes natural. But I will say this. I've always had a love since I was a little kid about Hollywood. Like, I always loved the mystique of it. Yeah. So I think me being here, creating stuff, I'm like a kid in a candy store or a kid yeah. in a mask warehouse. <laughs> but you find, it's weird because you, like, you find your own way here. Like, I think, I don't know what my expectations were. And I was older. I went to film school in my 30s. So I was like, you know, by that point in time, I was like, you know, I need a job. Um, and, and, and I'm not sure what my expectations were, um, but I know I, I hit the ground running. Like I, I knew that when I got here, I wanted to do stuff. It was like, I mean, I mean, I went a completely different way in some ways, and then in other ways, it's exactly what I was trained to do. Like, right. Yeah, it was, I mean, my, my start in, in effects came from Stan Winston, and I, was, I went to school to be a producer, and that guy said, you can just as easily produce an effects studio as you can a movie, and I, it was like, it didn't really register like what he was saying, but he was right. It's a, you know, for me, it was about putting the right people together on a creative project and then making it happen. And uh, I went into effects supervision from there um, because honestly, at, at heart, I was just a Halloween kid. I was just one of, you know, I wanted to make masks. I, you, can, I just, you can see your love for this on your face. Yeah. Every time that I see this man, whether it's at Trans World or <laughs> anywhere else, when he starts talking about making masks and, and creating this this kind of stuff, he just you just light up. You're I mean, like a I, spooky I, Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wanted to do this when I was a kid. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm I'm the kid that planned out my Halloween costume like in July. You know, maybe earlier. My parents used to laugh about it, and, and so you know, 
I always tell people, you know, if you're looking for a career change, maybe go back to that time when you were a kid and like, think about it, what, what you wanted to do then. That was a pretty pure thing. That's when nobody was telling you that you couldn't do that, you know? Even right. your own brain telling you that you couldn't do that. I mean, I went, I got, I went, I sidetracked for like 20 years. <laughs> and I had a couple other careers before I got back to this, but I went back to what I wanted to do when I was a kid. Can, can I just point out that we're having this like, fun conversation about dreams and we're surrounded by severed heads and bags. <laughs> I know, they're staring at me. <laughs> oh, you bastards. So we got more to see, right? <laughs> we do, we do have a lot more to see. Let's, stop. Right. Let's get out of the fort. We'll go, we'll go into, uh, <laughs> into the real world. So everything over here in these racks right now, these are getting ready for the Transworld trade show. And Transworld is like a huge trade show for the Halloween industry, attraction industry. And uh, all these crates, all these crates I have back here, they're gonna get loaded up with a thousand masks all shipping out in about a week. And then over here, this is a, a mask that I'm actually molding right now. Um, and we're trying to get this ready for the show. Uh, this actually was a, this, you can't see it because the sculpture on it, but this was uh, one of the sculptures that we looked at in the book recently over at Andrew's thing. Uh, sorry about the noise back there. There's a, a lot of it's work going on. It's a working shop. Don't be a sculpture, sorry. <laughs> totally. So yeah, so this is, uh, this is the Inquisitor mask. It's really an uh, intricate mold. It's a uh, second half is gonna be started tomorrow. Hopefully I'll have this guy ready for, uh, for the show. This is the mold catalog. Racks and racks and racks of molds. Every single one of these molds represents the sculpture that we made. Uh, this is where it all happens. After the sculpture is made, these molds generate all the mass that you guys buy. Um, so our first stop in the whole tour of like how these things are made is our mold preparation section, which we're gonna be walking over to. Um, it's where they basically clean the molds, prepare the core, put them inside the mold, bolt the mold together, and send it over to our casting section so that they can get poured. This place is massive. It's massive in here. Yeah, I know. So these are our cores. These are the, uh, the same exact armature that those masks that you saw Andrew in there sculpting, yeah. they sculpt on those. So that actual armature is saved afterwards. It's gonna go right back into that mold, and it represents the human head wearing the mask. First step is our mesh hood system. All these are patterned for the exact core that it's on. Um, they sit tight to it. They basically are a netting, a, a, a safety net for the mask. Um, Silicone is awesome, it's soft, it stretches. It's like a second skin and it can tear easily. And we don't want that happening to you guys because you guys spend a lot of money on these masks. So we put a safety net in the mask and this is a mesh encapsulation system. Um, Four-way power mesh, stitched and patterned to the hood. It goes over the core, and then we're gonna close the mold around it, bolt the mold together, and then we're gonna pour the silicone, and the silicone's gonna fill the mold and encapsulate through all the pores of this mesh system, and then it becomes tear resistant. And that's really, really important to us. We wanna make sure these are as strong for you as possible. We wanna protect your investment for you. And honestly, I don't wanna repair your masks. <laughs> we make a lot of masks. So we cast 22 to about 25 masks a day. Um, all of these are molds that have already been poured. Um, so Scott over here is our, our, the head of our casting department. He's opening a mold he just cast. Um, but what he does is he mixes up the silicone, pre-tints it a color, a base color it's gonna be, and then they fill these molds that are already prepared for, for, uh, for the day's castings. So right now, these are everything that's already been cast for the day. These are masks that he's working on, and he's also demolding a mask right now that I- uh, Can I peek? Trying so hard to stay out of his way. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> so Scott's using air, condensed air, to actually break the pressurized seal of a new mask. These are a nightmare sometimes. Seems like a lot of force has to go into that sometimes. It's, it's more like a lot of working, um, slowly working things, so you start feeling that the, 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 the seal pop, and then it releases itself, and you kind of work its way out of it. This is a brand new one, too, so it's gonna be a little stubborn on him but he's created a brace system to kind of work it out. And we'll use some chemical solvents like alcohol uh, to, to kind of lubricate it, air to pop some seals, and just good old fashioned pressure. And he works on it, eventually you're gonna, it's gonna pop and it's gonna come right out. So for the most part, whenever Scott gets a mold, it's already prepped, bolted together, and ready to go. 
But now and again, he gets especially molded. It'll arrive him with a part open or back open. And that's because Scott has to go in there and, and do some tricks in the casting. For example, this one has these really long spikes in the back of the head. We don't want them to wiggle and the wobble, right, when the, the actor's wearing them. So he goes in with a firmer density silicone, paints it actually into the mold, lets it cure, then he's gonna close the mold like this, then he's gonna pour the softer silicone, but these will stay more rigid in the casting. All right, and there is just so much to see here. I know, I know. Let's take you to the next step. So we just saw the mask being cast, right? Yep. When the silicone cures, then we open them up and we take the raw casting out. And this is what, what they look like. They're not that pretty, but they're there. So the silicone is cured. It's now, looks like the sculpture, but it's got an ugly seam line. It's got the pore spout here. It's still got the mesh system here. Right. right? And these gotta go to my paint department. They gotta look perfect for, the, for the, the client. So we take them over to the seam and patch department. That's what we're gonna visit right now. Which is this room in the back filled with all kinds of different artists. I know. <laughs> all right, so welcome to seam and patch. This is the seam and patch department. They're the ones in charge of making the mask uh, looking beautiful again. Uh, you just saw them come out of a, a mold. Uh, they've got all the little imperfections. Some of them have like uh, thin spots. Uh, some, some, some show the power mesh. Uh, they're all gonna have the pore spout. Uh, they're all gonna have little areas where the bleeder holes were at. And so they start off by trimming all that off, getting all the excess stuff off of it. And then they're gonna go back in with curing silicone, the exact same silicone that the mask was made out of. They're gonna thicken it. They're gonna turn it into almost like a, like a frosting-like consistency, and that's our patch. And then they're gonna go in with tools and solvents, and they're gonna blend it all back into the mask and make it look perfect. And this is Ashley. She's the head of our patch department, and she is working on a freshly cast death mask. I'm death. not gonna lie, I wanna wear it. <laughs> <laughs> so right now she's just taking off the, uh, the, the mesh seam. Like I was pointing out before that this is the protective mesh that makes the mask uh, like tear resistant. The other cool thing about using this mesh system for them, even the patch department, is um, they use it for their benefit. I mean, like it's really holding the mask together. Um, if we see sections that, uh, that, that tear, we can stitch them back up. This, this is all geared to make a more strong mask for the client, but also make a mask that could be easily repaired okay. if there's ever a problem in the future. So yeah, the mesh system is integral for, uh, for, for what we do here. I like that this one over here, it's still looking <laughs> so grotesque, but it still has that piece on the top that you were just talking yep. about. Yeah, the dongle. The dongle. <laughs> <laughs> Can we see the front the face of that? Yes. This is like a, this is an abstract. You know, this is one of those ones where it's just like a, a weird idea that became a mask. It's our, our deity mask. So we are also like, essentially mad scientists. <laughs> um, I like that. I, right, so it's not, it's not like, it, I mean, there's a lot of creative and there's a lot of science involved in this too. And so we're working with chemicals that have cure rates and, um, and, and catalysts and what makes them cure faster, what makes them cure slower. So um, heat is one of them. Um, and so we use temperature as a, to our advantage. Uh, many times you'll walk by and you'll see silicone in a walk-in refrigerator. We're using coolness to actually cool down the silicone and that extends the cure of it. And so we can pour a lot of mass because it's not curing quick. Um, on the flip side of things, we have a heat room. And this room over here um, has space heaters in it. And the patch department, which you guys just visited, they'll be placing their work in here using heat to accelerate the cure of the, the silicone. And then they can bring it back and add another layer to it. I like them in the windows. It's like a window <laughs> display. <laughs> There's so many weird nooks and crannies to our shop. So this is the part that everybody wants to see. This is uh, where the masks get their color. Uh, this is paint. And this is the paint department. And actually we're kind of in luck because we're, uh, we're painting a brand new mask for the very first time. We're doubly in luck because the rarity happened here. This is Santino, he's the head of our paint department. This is also Santino's very first sculpture done for Immortal Masks. So he actually sculpted the mask that he's laying the groundwork on the paint for. So it's a special day for you. It is a special day. You dressed day the part. I sure did. I sure did. <laughs> you know, I saw you over here earlier and I made a comment. I'm going to say it on camera. I mean, what you're sculpting. And I love the fact that you have this whole Jack Pierce thing about you. Oh, yeah. It, it's awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't be here without Jack Pierce. So it was nice to pay a little homage while bringing a new creature to life. <laughs> so. Yeah, this is a treat. It really is. Because, uh, I mean, again, um, 
I mean, we're, we're all attached to our work. And, you know, Santino gets to paint, lay down paint schemes for things that Andrew did. So there's a lot of trust back and forth, you know. Um, you know one visualizes it in form, the other one visualizes it in color. Um, and this one though, this is that special thing where it's like, you know, the creator is completely on his own work right now. Yeah, right. So if I screw it up, it's on me. You're right. But it looks good. Can we get a little closer look at it? Oh yeah. Look at that extra love going into it. That's right, a little extra That's sound. slick. These are reanimated masks. You know, it's an homage mask. There's only a million ways you can do right? uh, do, do the monster. Um, so there's some classic in there. There's some new school in there. Um, and then there's just ideas that we, we toss around. This was a fun one to watch evolve. Um, uh, can I share a little bit about what we, what we talked about? So when we're visiting the monster, and we do have a mask called Frank, so we have another version of him. And we've, we've had like other versions of the undead or the, the Mary Shelley creature. We were talking about this, and originally this almost started off as like, well, you know, for a better lack of words, a gimmick mask. Like, yeah. we were thinking of like, oh, let's suspend a brain inside of it, or let's light this up, or we even moved to a possible lighting device uh, down, down in the chest. And um, as we started, you know, discussing, I think a little bit more of, you know, both his love for it, and, and, and then also like things that would be economical, or, you know, that it kind of came down to, Let's look at it in more of a purist kind of way. Um, let's let's do an homage and let's put some stuff in there that that would be relevant to the, the storyline of the creature. Right. Um, so one of the things we play with is the burns. Yeah. Yeah. Monster falls from the windmill after being engulfed in flames. So obviously he would have some burning on him. So that was something we thought about. Easy access into the brain for the doctor. We thought about that. You know, it's part of the process is thinking really from a sort of a writing standpoint. Where is this creature? Where does it live? How does it operate? And that all goes into the design of the sculpture, to the paint job, and everything in between. So we're telling stories with rubber. It's fun. It is, man. That, see, that's, I was sitting here when you were talking about that. I'm like, it's, I knew what we visioned this company to be, like when we started it, when there was like four or five of us. But to have like 40 like-minded people that work on these things every day and honestly really love doing it too because it really like it means so much like to andrew and i when they pitch ideas and it like and and they pitch things because they see things that we don't even see it, it's fun like every single day like you know when we like spend the days that we're gonna do a movement video is like a, it's like oh yeah it's all yeah, exciting yeah see it yeah. all together in a costume yeah exciting. it's great this is the finishing department. This is where a painted mask will end up that needs teeth or horns or lighting systems. This is an example of one of those masks I was talking about where uh, we were like, wanted to do better than we were doing before. Back in the day, when we first started with our first light up mask, I think we were buying like uh, tea lights from uh, Amazon and putting them in like, and making an eye light up. And we're like, ooh, look what we did. And <laughs> as, as we've grown, we've uh, hooked up with uh, electricians, um, great effects people in the industry, and now we can actually design what, what we want the mask to look like and how we want things to work. So we have a great guy in Canada, uh, Chris from Made to Glow, shout out to him, um, who designed uh, the lighting system for our drone mask. And so we basically made a robot mask. He's waiting for his lens cap, it'll diffuse this lighting. Um, he's, the lens cap is in silicone, it gets glued on here. But in the meantime, we can change animations on it. Oh, that's fun. Yeah. And that's something that you typically wouldn't expect to see on somebody's head in the dark. Especially not in silicone. Right? Yeah, yeah. Like, like when this all started, you know, the first silicone masks that came out were like disguise masks. They were like, they were like traditionally, they were like an old man. Like, you know, that was a, that was a mask you put on. And then later people were like, well, you, you can make a character mask out of it. And they were keeping it close to the form, whatnot. We kept thinking past that. We kept thinking, well, you can build further than that. The, the material will allow for it. You can put lights into it. You can put smoke machines into it. Um, and it, it really is just whatever you imagine, whatever you can imagine, you can make happen if you put a bunch of creative heads together right. and think about it. Like I said, we really don't say no. We just might say not now. Um, this was an example. We wanted a cool robot mask, but we really wanted the focus to be on this like light and how it worked. and. We accomplished that, and he was, oh, he's already a couple years old, so I think like, we're already into like, okay, what next on some, on some new ones. 
All right, so this is Daniel. Daniel's the head of our finishing department. He's gluing in teeth right now on, this is Envy, right? Yeah, this is one of our Seven Deadly Sins masks. Um, it's called Envy. It actually has another face that hangs over these horns, like a, a human face, and it uh, has these really cool demonic exterior teeth that he's going in with a silicone adhesive and laying in resin teeth. And this is one of the, the duties of the last, last section, the finishing department. Um, teeth, horns, lights, uh, smoke systems. Um, Nails. Yeah, you name it. This is, this is the end game right here. Uh, it's looking cool. Yeah, it's, it's pretty menacing. So once it's in, he's gonna give it a nice touch of color. Then he's gonna seal it up and make them nice and shiny and sealed in a gloss. First things first though, we gotta make sure these teeth are in and staying, staying in place. My dentist gave me something a little similar to treat my teeth. And here you are creating gnarly teeth. So, true story. My, my dad's a dentist. I was supposed to become a dentist. I didn't. I actually went to schooling for it. Um, and, and, and my dad's one of my biggest fans. But I think he gets a kick mostly out of every time we're doing something that's dental oriented. So, you made those teeth? Yes, dad, we made the teeth. What'd you use? We use Flexicryl, dad. Oh, yeah. I call this the face-off shot. You see a lot of these on the TV show. Oh, God, yeah. Where it's looking down. That's funny. You mentioned this was like the face-off shot. I, I don't know if you guys realize, but Andrew uh, Andrew is season 12 winner of face-off. It's actually on Peacock right now. So, like, it's fun to kind of revisit and watch it, like, where he was and where this company was at that time. Like, we were just moving into this shop when his season aired, and it was, like, it was the last season shot of Face Off, but the second to last season that aired because they had a veteran season afterwards, but it was like they actually shot his season first. And oh wow. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fun to watch, kind of go back and watch like, uh, I mean, I just, so many memories of like what he, and how proud we were of him. Because like, I remember when he left, when we were like, okay, you can go do that show now. Like, I think our company is in a good enough spot that you, you can go be on a reality show. I'm like, but you better win it. And he did, so that was cool. Now, do, you, do you really feel like, something like that really helped or did you see not much of a uh, difference from winning it and i think i think it you all know what i'm saying yeah you know it's funny I, like i don't know i mean like like there was definitely some recognition you know that, that andrew was on the show i think i think it was a yay for our industry you okay. know like you know like because immortal had already been established i think we we're like five or so years deep by the time that andrew went and did that show so it was kind of like a you know, one of our guys got right. in there. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's yeah. cool. Yeah. Right, so this is probably one of the loudest places in our shop right now. But you guys came here for the blood. You came here for the gore. This is a QC and blood, and this is Nick, and he's the head of our QC department, and he's also in charge of making everything gory. We use a different silicone for blood because it has a better opacity than uh, than the the the, one, the paint that we're using to paint the mask. So we kind of treat this as the last of the last stages. This is the this is the final stop for all masks. Um, it's either going to pass through Nick's hands to get a blood treatment, or it's going to pass through Nick's hands to get a final once over to make sure the mask is perfect and ready to go to the shipping department. So this is QC, and that's Nick. You're the blood guy. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, moving right along. Um, new department, not new. Really, it's kind of a couple years old, but it's the newest department. And uh, it's the smallest one, and this is our digital department. Um, so traditionally, we were uh, clay sculptors. I mean, like we, we handle everything on a very traditional uh, basis. Uh, a couple years ago, we, we joined the digital revolution. <laughs> um, we were a little late to the game, but we're now utilizing quite a bit. Um, this is a zebra station. Stations. We do a lot of 3D modeling here, um, and then we do a lot of printing in here. Um, some of our masks actually are, uh, were all created digitally and we 3D printed the molds. Um, kind of a fun new thing we've been working with. Um, it works really well for things on the fly. Um, it works great for like uh, scan tech, like we scan our masks. We can work out ideas in, uh, in the mask itself in the 3D model. So like, for example, if we're doing like a, a character with, like a devil character with giant horns and we kind of want to see what it looks like before someone commits to sculpting it, like, a, you know, a, a symmetrical, uh, organic form, like a giant horn. 
So we can build it in the 3D model. We can scan the, the, the sculpture, bring it back in the 3D model, build the horn in the 3D model, see virtually what it's gonna look like, agree that that's gonna work, and then we can actually go print the horn, go back to the sculpture itself, finish the sculpture, and then by that time the print's done, then we're molding the print and we're creating the horn for that. And it's been, okay. yeah, it's been really fun. It's been like an interesting process utilizing the, uh, the tech as a tool. Utilizing the tech has actually made us be able to physically sculpt a bit more freely. Like um, back in the day, we might be concerned about the size of a head that we're sculpting because we know that that represents a lot of weight in silicone and that you know, traditionally you wouldn't want to do that because it could hurt an actor, it could right. be just a little too heavy. But we do know that if we could put a foam insert inside of that mask, we could make it um, you know, a, a lot uh, lighter, comfortable, um, uh, and, and, and we can, you know, the sky's the limits on how far we want to build out. So what we've been able to do recently is allow a sculptor just to go ahead and freely sculpt and then we'll take the, the sculpture, we'll scan it, we'll import it back into the model and then we'll, in, in the model, we'll 3D print um, what would become the, the foam insert. Uh, we'll print that, we'll take it, send it back to the mold shop, they'll mold that in silicone and then they'll cast a, um, a polyfoam insert that will go into the mold or onto the core close the mold around it, and then we'll pour the silicone and it encapsulates it, and now we just put this giant head that doesn't weigh that much. So um, this is predominantly our hair department. We do share it a little bit with our, our media side, so all our photography, all our videography of our, our uh, movement videos that happens in part of this room. But for the most part, this is hair. Uh, this is Danny. She's the head of our Hi, hair Danny. department. <laughs> and she is working on a, a, um, a hybrid mask. And this is actually a kind of a, we, we updated our brown version of what he's supposed to look like. And she is in the hair punching stage right now. Um, and here it's interesting. We'll kind of do a hybrid version of, like, of, of hair work where it's half punching, half laying. Um, these are sheets of National Fiber Technologies NFT four-way stretch hair. And this is synthetic hair that is bonded to a four-way mesh, a true four-way mesh. It's pretty awesome. Uh, the ladies will cut patterns um, that match the head of the mask that they're gonna be working with. They'll half glue it down, and then once it's glued down, they're gonna go back and they're gonna punch, and that's what Danny's doing right now. So like, I always wondered that. Yeah. Because you, know, like, you always hear like the stories of like, you know, with hair on masks, whether it's a werewolf, that people actually hand punch yeah. single strands. That, that, that really happens. You do that? Yeah. yeah probably going to be hard to see. There's little tiny barbs along the needle that the hair catches onto and it's pushing it into the silicone as I'm punching. Much respect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely have to zone out and just go. I'd be doing it with headphones. Yeah. Or something, you know? That's cool. That's cool. And then um, we'll take a peek over here kind of showing Mila doing a seal. We're peeking. Yeah. So we're gonna peek in on Mila right now and she is sealing in. Oh wow, okay, yeah. I see what you mean. So, so once they punch the, the hair all the way through, um, what they're gonna do is they're gonna use um, a silicone adhesive, thin down and spread out, um, and that's gonna seal all those little fine hairs into the mask. She's got headphones. Yeah, she's smart. <laughs> she heard us, <laughs> faker. <laughs> George, I have to say thank you for inviting us oh. into your shop. Oh, it was a pleasure having you. We've been wanting wanting to have this happen for like so long now. Right? Yeah. Like we've known each other for a couple years. Yeah. We yeah. run in the same circles, we yeah. have the same friends. And uh, every time we tried to make this happen, something big was happening. I know. And then, you know what? It worked out perfect. Like, you're getting ready for Transworld, I'm getting ready for Transworld. Right? I'm like, I think now. Just come and see what we're doing. You're going to see us in a couple of weeks anyways. Come see it being made. Now, before we go, I have to ask you, out of, out of everything, you've been, you've been, ever since you were a little kid, you wanted yeah. to be a mask maker. You're, you're doing it, you're working in the field, yeah. you're making, I wouldn't say dreams, you're making nightmares happen. That's hope, that, you're I living so. your nightmares. <laughs> Do you have any advice for the young mask maker that's making homemade masks in their kitchen, ruining their mother's like you know kitchen, their, their sink, their ovens? But like they have dreams just like you. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, I mean, like the, I think the two things from that starting point is one, educate yourself. Like, so, so there's great resources out there. The Stan Winston School is one of them. Um, those are going to lay the foundations of like of what you need to know to start doing this. And the other one is just don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. 
like, 100 percent yeah yeah like 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 you can you you can you can turn this into a living you can you know you can do what you wanted to do when you were a kid and you can actually turn it into a career um just find out how to do it that's it like 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 it's out there it, it really is like there's there's great resources um and just don't give up on your imagination man it's going to steer you the right way you forgot one of the most important ones. What's that? There's Stan Winston School. There's all these other things. There's also this video. There is. This, yes. this amazing video. Yes. So kind, walking us through and showing everything. Oh, thanks. And you know what you said about you know just going for it. Don't let anybody tell you not to do it, especially if it's something you're passionate about. I mean, yeah. we were talking earlier. You've had those instances. Yeah. We've had those instances, and all here it we did are today. is it, all it did is it sidetracked me for a while. I mean, I, I'm I'm thankful for every experience I've had in my life. But you're over there. I, I honestly think that I probably <laughs> could have started a long time ago. Um, so so if someone if if I knew if I was going back and telling the young kid of me like what I know now, it'd been like, you could start this right away. You could right? you could get going on this right away. Yeah. But then there's just something magical about the journey of getting there. Oh yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. realizing that I'm here and I'm here to stay. Yeah. And I think you guys are. You know, immortal masks are phenomenal. We see them all the time. And I'm I, I'm I'm sorry to say this, we do not own one of your masks yet. Oh, uh, we can change that. But I'm telling you what, when you see these things, you're gonna want to put it on and go scare your grandma. We always love grandmas here. And uh, with that being said from Immortal Masks. Thank you for joining us on another grim adventure. Until next time, spooky hands, get spooky it out hands. there. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Bye guys, thanks for coming. Wherever I come, I'm in luck. It's come my way. Wherever I go, hard luck. Is that it stays? Good luck never stays a day. A bad luck's always coming my way. 